was this huge southern supercontinent that was covered with forest. And about 70 million years ago, New Zealand broke off and drifted away like the ark from Gondwanaland, carrying two of this and two of that. get a bulldozer and start rolling it and smashing it down in thousands of acres at a time. It's, um, it's shitting in your own nest, to put it bluntly. That's what we're doing. Stop now the selling of the land. Ake, ake tunas. Never going to be disturbed. Leave us alone. New Zealanders generally have had a guts full of losing forest year after year after year and want to say enough is enough. People are realizing now, for the first time maybe in two centuries, that uh, they cannot go on destroying what nature had provided. This cry inside that I can't get rid of, of what's happening to our own environment uh, in Aotearoa. Yes, it's interesting that the more perhaps one looks into New Zealand's forests, the more one realises just how unique they are. That if you talk to a, a West Coast miller, he'll often say, This native bush here is not very attractive. If you get in underneath it, it's not attractive. It's far from attractive. Compared to the North Island bush, it's actually, um, it's a brothel. And yet, if you look at the, the origin of our forests, our forests are the nearest to probably the, the dinosaur forests as David Bellamy describes them. This is one of the most special places on the face of this earth, part of the great dinosaur forest of New Zealand. Yes, it was through forests like this that the dinosaurs walked when they ruled this planet. They, they date back to the great southern continent of Gondwana land some 80 million years ago, and the great remus that are around us here, the kakatiyas, those trees have their ancestors going back 80 million years. Well, Gondwana land was this huge southern supercontinent that was covered with forest. And basically it brought together Antarctica, Africa, Latin America, Australia, New Zealand and even India in a great southern landmass that covered the whole southern part of the globe. And about 70 million years ago, New Zealand broke off and drifted away like the ark from Gondwanaland, carrying two of this and two of that. Uh, and I think that's something that 
as a New Zealander, I feel a bit excited about. I mean, over in Europe, they've got their cathedrals and uh, their ancient art treasures and so on. Well, here in New Zealand, we have a natural heritage that is 70 million years old, that is unique in the world, and which takes us back into what the world was like before there were humans, um, even in some cases before there were any flowering plants. We go back that far. Uh, it's a strange and wonderful world, but we have it here in New Zealand, and uh, I love it. Elsewhere in the world they did have those forests, but more recent plants evolved which effectively swamped out those trees. This didn't happen in New Zealand because we were isolated and with our unique animals, the kiwi, tuataras um, and other ground birds, coupled with our unique forests, they've sort of survived in isolation for 80 million years until really the, about a thousand years ago the first Polynesians arrived. They had a, a, a natural harmony with nature anyway. Otherwise they would not have had the faith to, to travel all those, that long distance on a fragile sort of canoe. So they had a fairly good knowledge of the science of the stars and of the sea. So they didn't come here as a bunch of idiots. They were already scientists before they arrived here. It was just a matter of trial and error. The myth is that the Maori people were living in total harmony with nature. Um, they were very religious in their attitude towards natural forces, but this doesn't mean that they didn't do anything that impacted on nature. Prior to their coming here, they had been used to the idea of nature supplying everything. And all of a sudden they came to a country which had more inclement weather than they had been used to. And you didn't have all the things that you were able to pick off the trees. And so you developed an, a new system of coping with the environment, learning how to use the, the natural things that they found here. Well, over about 800 years, almost 50% of the forests were destroyed. 12 species of moa became extinct. At least 20 other species of birds became completely extinct. A lot of other birds, like the takahe and the kākāpō, were very severely reduced in their habitat, the tuatara. And we're just beginning to discover that a lot of little things, too, um, lizards, uh, frogs, insects, either became extinct or were reduced to toeholds on offshore islands and places like that. But one of the things that's terribly important to understand is that they had to live and they couldn't send out for relief from home uh, when things went wrong. Uh, we had to rely on the natural resources around us to um, probably for over half our food supplies. If we didn't grow things, we didn't um, survive, you know. Uh, so no, I, I don't blame them at all. I, I don't like to see the myth perpetuated that they were perfect conservationists. Uh, but I think what they did is entirely understandable. Just imagine our people coming from the islands, coming over to this country. They landed here in, in, in summertime. No idea of what seasons were, because they could grow their food stuff in the islands right through the year. So they brought over their techniques, their gardening techniques of slashing and burning and planting. And they soon learnt. They must have learnt in the first one or two hundred years that they can't carry on doing that because they depended on nature largely for their survival. And so many things were evolved, a type of sustained uh, conservation, if you like, over the generations of my family being in this area, um, they used the Rahui system. Uh, if uh, an area like we're sitting in was being depleted of one 
certain species of shellfish, I'm sure our elders would have made sure that uh, that area would have been completely uh, banned for the removal of any uh, seafood for quite a number of months. I think there were balances in certain areas and with certain types of, of activity from time to time, but these tended to be fragile balances. Um, and of course the arrival of Europeans set it all off again. I mean, that's understandable, uh, but that was the way the balance sort of tipped again. Our forebears sailed the ocean to paradise unseen with a cargo of civilization, a ticket to a dream. Well, European settlement was more of the same. Uh, it was a continuation of the process that started when the first Polynesians landed here. Maoris had brought rats and dogs, Europeans brought more predators, which increased the effect on the native birds particularly. More forest was cleared because the land could be put to other uses than standing in forest. We've got all the timber from the, from the valley there, right up in the, the side of Panguru, right up to the hills, right inside. They cleared all that. I saw the tram line with the, uh, the tram line with the engine going up and carting all these things on the truck down to the mill at Panguru. They put all these logs there, ready to come into the mill, you know, to be sold. But all oh, stacks and stacks are so. <laughs> In some ways, I think the mid-19th century was the worst possible time for New Zealand to be settled uh, by uh, a European uh, uh, society. Um, the settlers who came here came from an England uh, which had become heavily industrialised. Um, the, whole eth the whole work ethic was simply to make money. And I think uh, it was almost inevitable that when the settlers came here, they saw the country uh, not as a place uh, to relate to in any spiritual way, but uh, as a resource to be used for material ends, which they did very, very um, successfully, um, depending on how you perhaps qualify the word success. forests were really quite a, a foreign thing, that they came here expecting the open glades of Europe and discovered instead this primeval jungle. And I think a lot of uh, early settlers really felt threatened by the primeval jungle and, and did their best to sort of carve out their clearing and then wipe out the forest and, and really trying to transform New Zealand into a little uh, Europe. Ticket to a dream. The bush must go was a cry for generations. Um, here on the coast, um, uh, very, very strongly, because um, this area, as much as any in New Zealand, was so heavily forested that um, it was very, very hard for pioneers to establish any sort of farmland here to make roads and to lay railways and so on. I can remember when I was a boy, them, they'd fill a whole hillside of virgin bush They'd nick it all, and they'd set a trigger tree at the top, and they'd let that one go, and it would fall, and it would, the whole hillside, like the one behind here, would crash to the ground. It, it would bring the whole hillside down, a magnificent sight. I'd hate to see it today. <laughs> and then, after a few weeks or months, the men would, would get on the horses with blocks of pumice soaked in diesel oil, and they'd set fire to these, and they'd gallop round the edge, touching it, so it all burnt off at once. And those fires burnt for weeks, some of them. 
children for the Maori who first discovered the country and then later for the Europeans, uh, what they found here was a country that was as unspoiled, as natural as any that was left in the world. And uh, mm. in the course of a century, we've changed it completely. Yeah. So whether God's own is still appropriate, I don't know. There was no, I don't think there was very much in the way of self-questioning by the settlers or their uh, descendants for two or three generations. We are the questioners today because of the uh, situation of the whole planet. Well, when I first started living in the bush, nobody could have imagined and nobody did imagine that you'd ever exhaust that resource just the same as the fish around the coast. And uh, it's only in these last few years that, that we've started to realise that we're actually whittling away at it in a, an alarming rate. And uh, there is a, you could a actually envisage now a time when it'd be very short of bush in this country, and it, let's face it, it's our best resource. It's the only thing we can't really spend. We, it'll keep on making the country one of the most beautiful parts of the earth. And we've got to lay off knocking the bush about just for openers. I had the impression that uh, there was a rapid change in the mentality of people now, here in New Zealand. People are realizing now, for the first time maybe in two centuries, that uh, they cannot go on destroying what nature had provided. These are the things that are coming to mind these days to every thinking man and woman. There's a few Sheilas in the scrub these days. Nice to see them. We're living in a different world now. It's different from when we were young. Uh, we didn't have to think about these things. There were more immediate things. There, were bu there was bush that needed clearing. I mean, my family were miners. Our conservation officer over here, Kevin Smith, his families were, were loggers. And perhaps it's interesting that, you know, the second generation, us, are coming and saying, well, you just can't, you can't do it. It has no future. All of my mother's family have left the coast simply because there was no jobs continuing what they were doing. That uh, you wiped out the resource and then left. Yeah, well, you know, we did go through, a, clearly the country went through a pioneering phase where there were, the resources were virtually unlimited. Uh, development was the name of the game. And then suddenly as the resources became obviously limited, the public began to be aware that there was a limitation to the amount of development that could, could continue without impairing other values. And we're at that stage now. We've become aware of the limitation of the resources. We've become aware of maybe the need to say enough is enough for development of some of these areas and we want to retain some in the natural state. I think uh, perhaps the first time that the politicians realised how much support there was for saving native forests was when we did something a bit radical and uh, sent a team of protesters to climb up the trees in Poriora Forest. Um, the logging gangs were going in to fill these trees, our people were up in the treetops whistling. is a really important place. It's where the gut feeling and concern at the destruction that had been going on for generations of our forests gelled and everybody uh, pulled together and supported the protest against this terrible destruction that was going on. I think what surprised the Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister, Mr Muldoon, was the, the 27 different newspaper editorials from all around New Zealand, little provincial towns, all 
riding in support of us, all except one actually. There was this feeling that it was wrong to be cutting down those trees in Porirua Forest, and that in fact the protesters were right. There's only one way can we can do any good, and that's walk down there and stop those trees from going down. That's the only way. With the conservationists hiding in trees and under logs and things, do you think that you're putting them at risk? No, I don't think so. They're putting themselves at risk. Now, Mr Muldoon was not the sort of Prime Minister to be inclined to think that protesters were right. In fact, he was quoted in the early days as saying that he wasn't going to give in to a young rabble of protesters up in the trees. But within 24 hours, he changed his tune on that. And I think that what happened was that he realised, and his colleagues realised, that New Zealanders wanted those trees saved. So that was a turning point for us. And at about the same time we were gathering signatures for the Maruia Declaration, a big nationwide petition on protecting native forests, uh, well, it all really began on the snow in the Maruia Valley. And there were 50 or so of us camped out overnight in, this, in these freezing cold conditions to launch the Maruia Declaration. The TV cameras were there in the morning as we sort of crept out of our tent with the steam issuing from our mouth and, and uh, standing around warming our hands around the uh, bonfire. This petition, who is it meant to impress? Well, we've got to convince the people of New Zealand that it's worth, what we're saying is worthwhile, but essentially we're fighting with the Forest Service and we've got to get each politician in the country to make a stand one way or other on the six principles that are in the declaration. And we'll circulate it throughout New Zealand for as long as we need to to get you know, a hell of a lot of signatures. Uh, and what excited me about that petition was just walking down streets and knocking on doors and finding that nine out of every ten people that you'd approach wanted to sign the petition. We went into the street where Mr Muldoon lived and we got every single person in that street to sign the petition except Mr Muldoon himself. And, you know, that was exciting because what it showed was that there was a pretty broad support for giving much greater legal protection to native forests. So I think those two things, the treetop protest and the petition, they put us on the map and they made people realise that conservation was something that had to be, uh, had to be accommodated and built into the, uh, into the body of New Zealand politics. But I, I think that um, the real changes didn't really happen until um, the election of the Labour government in 1984. And at that time, the Forest Service got split up, um, the Department of Conservation was created, and that, in a, in a sense, was a culmination of the 10 years of work that we'd put in up to that date. It, it just sort of rounded it off. We've now, of course, got new, new battles to fight. This is an auspicious occasion. I am glad to declare that the Department of Conservation is formally launched. There it is. Thank you. The Conservation Department we've campaigned for for years, and the Forest and Bird Society, I was looking back in 1935, they were arguing for a, a, a government agency charged with a single-minded responsibility to protect our heritage. It took, what, another 50 years, but finally we've got it. It'll only be with some sort of historical hindsight that we'll be able to really understand the, the sort of revolution that has occurred um, in recent years. And, there's been a real turnaround, I think, in the way that we respond to our environment and, and the recognition that we are now beginning to have uh, of the implications of some of those actions we have undertaken, really without understanding quite what we were doing. Both the, the Polynesian voyagers who first came to Aotearoa and, and the, the Europeans who arrived here some 150 years ago were representatives of, of cultures for which the concept of the, the frontier has always been important. Uh, and I think really what we have to accept now is the fact that we, there are no new frontiers. We've hit the physical frontier and we have to make the psychological adjustment to recognizing that there is nowhere to move on to. Some people have certainly outgrown the pioneer ethic. Uh, some people certainly haven't. Uh, as a nation, I think we teeter a bit on the brink. We take two steps forward and then one step back. What's happening at the moment is that um, 
the Chipmill Company is uh, clearing quite large blocks of beech forest on private land throughout the county. And after it's been through and removed the forest, the farmer usually comes along then and burns the site and tries to put some grass on it. Not always very successfully, of course, a lot of the grass that's been laid has been uh, reverted into bracken fern pretty quickly. Um, and at the present rate at which the Chipmill Company is going through this county, all the remaining beech forest on private land will be gone in 15 years. These are the times where we know we've got this power and authority to do these things to the environment that we live in. But uh, we've got to start thinking very seriously about when we're going to stop doing it. And if we stop it right now, it's going to be too late. Distressingly, this sometimes seems to be related to economics, whether we can afford it or not. Uh, but as a, a long-term believer in conservation myself, I feel we, we can't afford not to. Uh, with the freeing up of the economy, what we're seeing is a very great increase in the exploitation of, of native forests on private land. Um, wood chip exports of, of native species have gone up three times since 1982. Um, log exporting, exporting of, of beach logs, for instance, has risen dramatically just in the last 12 months. And uh, there's a very sort of um, open market, free market situation being created. And that is actually, in the absence of any controls, that is really bad news for, for private forests. We're still pioneering. We still have uh, the idea that we're here to get something out of this place. Um, we're here to take its resources not to live with them. But, well, you know, we've got to get, countries got to make money out of something, you know, and this you know, one way of making it. It's, I can bring more money and then, you know, long bring a lot of money into New Zealand, I think that's what we're after, isn't it? Mm. These trees are taken, in some cases, hundreds of years to, to grow, in, in many cases, and rather than, than whipping in and on, a, say, a 70-year cycle, flattening a lot, shipping it overseas to, to countries that are preserving their own, as I see it, and, and using ours because we're silly enough to sell life cheap. Uh, we don't value it, and that's about damn time we did. So. I mean, in Japan they have huge forests, for instance, but they never touch them. They come down and take our forests. Uh, they don't touch their coal reserves. They come down and take our coal. They don't touch their fish reserves, you know, they have huge systems of, of uh, reefs and things around Japan that, uh, that they've built and carefully sort of set the environment back up again. They don't touch them, they leave them alone, they come down and get ours. <laughs> you know, they're smart cookies, these guys, and uh, the Japanese and the Taiwanese and whatever, and if we're, as long as we're silly enough to sell it cheap, well, they'll keep buying it. And the end result of that will be similar to places like Chile, where you know, all the people were taken off the land to work in fish processing plants. Uh, their land was bought round behind their backs, so they no, had a, no land to go back to, and then their fishing resources were exhausted. And that's exactly the same process we're into here. You're acting with your natural resources like uh, Kenya or, or a very low grade uh, developing country in the third world. You're selling your substance. It's shitting in your own nest, to put it bluntly. That's what we're doing. Blindly, we're blind. And the more of us that realise that this must be uh, adopt a moderate view of it should be adopted, uh, the more moderate the view will be. I can't see us trying to do anything about anything except this, this magical sort of uh, um, overseas debt. You know, we're more interested in, the, in our overseas debt and our economic situation than we are in our people and our land. You see, because the wealth of any nation isn't what it produces in terms of consumer goods or even crops, but it's what it leaves behind in good heart for the benefit of all future generations. It's time now to get our act together and uh, educate ourselves and everybody else how important the scrub is to us. Because it's our, it's our wealth, it's our future, it's the future for our kids and their kids and their kids. And uh, we've got to start to think whether they're going to be looking back on us as a bunch of bloody vandals or not, of what we're doing now. Something, I mean, something what do you unique. Do, what do you do when the tree goes down? 
Oh, I don't mind. Grab a 120cc saw and rip into it. It's not a bad screw. It's just another tree to me. It's a good part of spelling them. I don't quite enjoy that. I had no idea when I was a youngster, and not many people really have been as, as destructive as the next man. I used to love getting on a bulldozer and ripping the place around. There's nothing like a chainsaw, you know, to knock a tree down. It's a, it feels good. It's a great thing to do to knock it up and burn it. And uh, the, all the men that I worked with in the bush that, that I know about uh, would agree with me now. We've got to lay off. We've got to stop knocking this bush around. As far as Barry Trump goes, he's all bloody bullshit. Uh, I mean, to say, like, you know, he's... he's he, as far as I know, Barry Trump's never cut down a tree. No, that's right. And he hasn't done a lot of other bloody things he said he's done, too. No. Uh, I mean, to say, like, you know... Well, well, I'm not denying it. Right. Sometimes you think, you know, when you came down a big Rimu tree, you know, it's been there, it's been there, it's been there, it's been there for 100 years, you know? <laughs> even 200, 300 years, and then you feel a bit guilty about it because, you know, you're only 26 or 27, and you've mowed it down, and you know, it's taken that long time, long time to grow, you know, so you feel a bit guilty, so you make sure you take all of it out. You don't leave any of it behind, so. It was like deer. Like, nobody likes to knock a beautiful stag or hind down with a, sneak up on it with a gun and blow it to bits. But um, it's one of the things that had to be done, and I noticed that, all the old hunters used to say oh, they didn't shoot a hind. They shot a lousy, hammer-headed old bitch of a hind standing there looking at me, it was. <laughs> you had to make an excuse to do it. The, the whole forest is dying. Um, some areas it's been accelerated with uh, more of the pinhole and, and the rot. Uh, and really, what else can you do with um, with this type of timber? It's uh, it's full of pinhole. It's either full of pinhole rot, and that uh, is I can only see one end use for that, and that is wood chips. Give me an example. There's a there's an, uh, an area of bush over the other side of the rice sap, isn't there? And you look across onto it in the back of that pig farm. And it's bloody all dying, isn't it? Yeah, Native it's bush, because it's surrounded by exotics. Now, that stuff should be taken out, but because it's in a bloody certain land title, you're not yeah. allowed to touch it. Now, that's wrong. What land title is that? Well, it's a crown, you know, it's bloody scenic reserve or crown, something or other. Crown land or something stupid. Well, you know, that's, yeah. that, that's diabolical, really, isn't it? I maintain if you cut down a tree, you can always replant a, a pine or two or three pines or more. And you're putting back the environment. It's a very attractive setting. It's a tourist attractive. And it's also environmental attractive. It's just nice to see a young, thriving, logged over area that's made the comeback and it's on its way back. Mm -hmm. So from the point of view of health and, and appearance, uh, attractiveness, appeal to tourists and everything else. Um, Cutover can be equally as attractive, and in fact more attractive, than a lot of the overaged forest that we've got. One of the, the local vicar got up and he said that you, you smell it. And we all thought, what, what does he mean? And he said, you come and drive over Lewis Pass from Christchurch and you get to the top of Lewis Pass and you step out of the car and you can smell it. And we thought, gee, what is it? And it turned out, he said, it's the stench of the rotting forest. He said, what we've got to do is we've got to sanitise these forests. And sanitising meant, in fact, taking out the, the, the old, senile, decadent, over-mature trees and, and cleaning it all up so that it was nice and neat and tidy. And all you had was uh, these, these nice rows of young trees without this horrible stench. And, you know, native timber, when it stands for so many years, it goes rotten up the centre and it falls over, but it doesn't regenerate. So it can't regenerate because it's laying dead on the ground. Those old trees fall to the forest floor and on their trunks there's a remarkable number of young seedlings of Rimu, Kahikatea and other trees come up. So far from these, these forests being really one croppers that when it falls over that's the end, it's really just the beginning of life. Take away those big trunks and of course it's effectively the kiss of death on those forests in the long term.
Are we ever gonna tame this millennia of man? I can hear the heartland bleeding. Well, you have transformed two thirds of the forest into uh, land for sheep grazing. Uh, there's one third left, about. And now you have to be very careful not to reduce the proportion. Well, I think if we look right through New Zealand, the North Island, virtually all the lowland forest is now completely gone. The east coast of the South Island, burnt by the pollinations and then further cleared by European settlers. And in fact, the last of the east coast forests are being wiped out right now on the Catlins way down in southeast Otago. And that's why, of course, the west coast forests are so important. 50% of New Zealand's remaining forests are found on the west coast of the South Island. Um, South Westland are the best, has the best remaining of those forests. We own them. Western County Council own a lot of trees, but everybody else in the country is saying, no, you're not, you're not allowed them. You've got to leave them there, right? Don't chop them down, because one day we might get to look at them. I would even go as far as to say that all native forests in this country, for instance, should be preserved at present. I, I, I know that's controversial and it's even controversial on the west coast but I think that we have altered this landscape so much in a time which in nature's terms is very very short that those areas that we are lucky enough to still have intact are one of the country's most precious resources. She has got a right to be there like you and I have, yeah. But it's there, surely it's there for us to use. Don't you think? You think it should be there just to be there, like a mountain? I think the problem with areas like the West Coast is that they're a pretty beleaguered community. They haven't really got alternatives other than to exploit the natural environment. And I feel some sympathy with some of them at a hu on a human level, I suppose. But at the same time, they do go a bit overboard. And they, you know, there are some terrible uh, bigots and prejudiced people down there. I mean to say, as far as we're concerned, I mean to say, the minority groups in this country have more say than the majority of the people that work in these places. Oh, they're frightened. They have frightened of conservation, but uh, you have to have some, you know, you don't get on without a bit of humour in life, but when I was a young fellow, I was frightened of hell. Quite frightened of hell. It seemed a pretty bad place. Um, then, uh, of course, as we get older, we're frightened of the Russians. And now we're frightened of the conservation from over the hill. Uh, it's a view and cry in Westland. Um, it annoys me that the conservation movement make out that the whole of South Western is going to be clear fell. And uh, the landscape destroyed, which is not true. I feel quite strongly about this because I think that television tends to take out of context certain things that are said and made West Coasters look as if they're going to chop the last half acre of trees down or dig up the last half acre of soil for gold and leave it as it is. And we're made to look as if all we want to do is to modify everything and it's not right. Like I, my children are still going to see beautiful bush. Like I like bush and we got bush in our farm and I'm not going to cut all the trees down. And the trees around here never ever be cut down. Uh, but I'd like to see a few millable trees cut down to produce income for our community and for New Zealand. Most people down here are pretty <coughs> conservation conscious really, the farmers and that. You don't find any of them cutting down trees unwantedly. Yeah. Um, they're still a little bit grumpy about us, but by and large they're, they respect us and uh, they're willing to recognise that we're striking a balance and that we do care about people. So what do you reckon about Guy Salmon? He's alright, he's alright. He's got to be some bugger to put his head on a bloody block. I think the New Zealanders needed to have the finger shaken at them by conservationists or people who've seen that we need to have areas looked after. I think we needed to be told, take breath, think what you've done. 
but I think we also need to know that here we've got this resource and it needs development as well as preservation otherwise the whole fabric of the west coast will just disintegrate and is that what we really want? Cl clearly the land is there to be used it's a question of what you use it for you know do you use it for its natural in its natural state or do you modify that natural state and use it for some other purpose? Now like every other nation we're moving headlong into the future of how we get along and listen, you know it's our future too. It's a peculiar problem for New Zealand because obviously most of our wealth comes from land-based industries or from the sea. But what we have been able to demonstrate is that there is a unique coalition of interest between conservationists and producers. Our farmers, curiously, are some of our best conservationists. The world might say, is it not for a farmer to actually take from the land everything that he or she can? The answer to that is that farmers know that they can't. They're in a long lifetime renewable industry. And so you can actually demonstrate economical benefits out of being careful. The notion that in some countries you can go and plunder an entire indigenous forest for a quick cash return from good log, leaving behind a wasteland, is something which no longer occurs to a New Zealander. I think that a lot of people um, can recognise that it doesn't make a lot of sense to do what's happening in this district, which is a businessman to fly into the district, buy up a couple of hundred hectares of beech forest, clear fell the lot, sell the logs to the chip mill, and then abandon the land and clear out. I mean, nobody likes that. Um, and what we're wanting to do, I think, is to go back to the old idea of, uh, of sustainability and renewal. Um, the idea which I think is quite strong in, the, in, the, in Māori culture um, that you know you don't overuse resources if you're taking too many fish you, you, you put a rahui on an area to allow the, um, the seafood to build back up again that sort of concept and we can uh, apply that to forests through planning schemes uh, or through uh, particular government policies and that's something which will get uh, stronger and bolder and this government has put in place uh, conservation uh, administration which doesn't just preserve an old tree or give a designation to an old house doesn't just protect endangered species of flora and fauna but actually moves to see that there is some sort of uh, global view if you like of all our natural resources ranging from the territorial waters to the top of the inmost mountain it's, and that is what the whole concept of the department of conservation is about we're not, we're not sure there's major reservations on the conservation side. Is this department going to be the, the panacea that will mean that we can all pack our bags and go to the beach and have a good time? I wish it was, but I'm pretty sure from what we've seen even already that that department is going to need strong support from the public groups, and it's also going to need uh, some pretty astute public groups to make sure that it keeps on doing what it's charged with. Really, if everybody isn't involved in understanding the environment, then we can't survive because the, the understanding of the, the environment has to be a personal thing. It can't just be handed over to Michael Smither or David Lange or the Minister of the Environment or whoever, uh, and, and it's their responsibility. It's everybody's responsibility. There's some tremendous opportunities. There's an urgent need now in the late 20th century to basically appreciate the environment we've got around us and develop or increasingly develop the sense of consciousness of New Zealanders that really it is something special and deserves to be protected and that that protection is not uh, something you do as an afterthought it's something you think about first of all. in universities, it comes from waking up beside nameless streams, it comes from walking on a beach like Truman's Beach down here, just, just in the evening, ten minutes from the road, on your own, listening to the sounds of the sea and the seabirds, the wind, watching the waves, looking at the stars. 
but we need to consider the creative, sensitive writers and artists and poets, people who have told us what the land is about. High tide, the seething thunder of the waves, white fury recoils upon itself. The smoke of spume cascades from wet black rock. Waves grind abrasive sands at roots of cliffs where flax and moss let fall drops of sweet water to the salt harsh shaping of new worlds. Calmly you distill a new creation. With coloured brush command a fury, outmaster waves resolve the flux of time. The lifted mind, a centre of chosen power. Only the artist rides this chaos, reigning its potency, finding his peace to deriving order from tumult, breaking the rock to free the imprisoned dream. Well, that's, that's what I've always regarded as my job, is teaching people how to look, um, sort of skinning people's eyes, making it available to them. Nobody, saw, nobody cared a stuff about the rocks in Taranaki until I painted them. That's something you do. That's uh, something that gives me intense pleasure, actually, being able to say to people, hey, look, you know, a leaf is a beautiful thing. Look, it's like a canopy, you know, it's like a wing. It's, uh... Well, some it will be the, the joy of watching a huge tree, the lush, dank undergrowth of a forest with a canopy with bird life. For others, it'll be listening to Mozart. That's what the range of things is in New Zealand. But the fact is that you can always capture Mozart on a record, but you can never reproduce Tane Mahuta. And that is what really the challenge is all about. We have to preserve a range of possibilities for people to feel a sense of their individual human destiny and their, their somehow inextricably, inextricable commitment to their physical environment. That's absolutely critical. Oh, I think so. You sort of, I think you've been brought up all your life to expect this, haven't you really, even as children? Well, you have, yeah. because uh, you've always lived in areas like this, and uh, it's hard to understand that there's people throughout the world that uh, can't see this sort of thing. We've yeah. got that use of it in our upbringing right from children, that uh, you just take it as the natural thing for New Zealanders. Yes, look at those, look at those flocks of godwits coming in there now. You know, once, once you look at that, you, I, I don't have to explain anything anymore. You, you, you understand what I'm talking about. I, I'm glad of the fact that most New Zealanders do get into the native forest. They do know the names of some of the plants and the, and, and, and the animals, and, and they do get to know the seasons and um, they do feel they belong here. And that sense of belonging, I think, is tremendously important. The Māori people have got it, and, and we Western Pākehā, we settlers, we've got to get it as well, or we can't really claim to belong here. Um, I belong there a little more than I did 20 years ago. Uh, there's still a huge distance to go, and I don't think any of us are going to live like some of the pioneers did, but I hope that as a whole, uh, we as a nation, we as a planet are, are learning to live, uh, you know, with a better understanding, a closer affinity of, of all the natural forces around us. And I, I just think it's a, it's a very optimistic idea, it's a good idea. And I, I think the land is marvellous and the better I understand it, hopefully the happier I'll be. were kids, our mother told us that if we were given something to look after, don't abuse it, because if you looked after and you did abuse it, it would last that much longer. You know, you, you, you got twice the value out of it what you did if you abused it. And the crux of the matter is 